Mysteries of Phrygia. Eoi Koribant ye magna mater, mater deorum kibena. The priest of Attis responded once to St. Augustine, who furiously declared that in this way pagans will deceive us with et ipse Pilatus Christianum est. Jerome perversely transformed the title of the Phrygian Mother of Gods to the Mother of Demons, in his own peculiar malice. There is an old Christian custom known since antiquity to reverse the meaning of pagan mysteries, reducing them to absurdity of Christianity and then attaching derogatory names to them. Thus the multitude of Jewish Gnostic sects, with doctrines approved or declared heretical during the Council, triumphed. Not by the superiority of their nimble thought, but by vulgarizing all the higher, sacred mysteries of nobility. Christians, wallowing in the mire of their own petty distortions, were never able to destroy the complex, advanced, sophisticated theology of the nobilitas. They were forced to attack to something we might contemporarily call a kind of a reductionist Marxism, yes, Christians, from which modern Christians so vehemently distanced themselves. Therefore, by reducing the entire complexity of the superstructure of pagan ideas to their own mire of shit, and from the level of absurdity, they brought forth the ineloquent bulldozers, where they delighted in the superiority of their crucified corpse over the noble gods and heroes. Then, through an attempt to erase the higher pagan theology from all memory, from all history, by way of absorption what they could, they sought to block the path of theological constructs that surpassed anything the Galileans were able to comprehend during their so-called Philosophia Perennis, with its universalist inflated pretensions. How could the Theologia Prisca be superior to the Vatican hyenas? The product of this historical distortion was growing sectarianism, the negation of any metaphysics as well as naive materialism and realism. Thus the religion of destroyers, Christians and zealots had within it the seeds of their own self-destruction upon closer scrutiny of logical historical processes later paved by science. It's a pity that in this process what was once valuable was eliminated. Till this day, in their delusions, they think they have stolen the heavens, though the heavens seem to ignore the religion from the Levant and their crucified corpse, while Jews, Christians and Muslims are left to the windy ethers of the earthly and underworld Hades as shadows, never testing the true heavens. The sword of Eden, according to old Arabic pre-Islamic word, Edin, which meant a fertile pre-desert meadow, was barred from Jews, Christians and Muslims from access to the Sumerian fruits of immortality amongst gods. The first betrayed Babylon by slandering its teachings, the second, Christians, following their elder brothers, lied and poisoned the world, annihilating the Ophid, serpent mysteries, katabatic art, solar priesthoods. The third, the Muslims, by some diabolic instinct, destroyed the remnants of what was, growing in strength and with the death of Ismaili sect, which fought for the remnants of reason, neoplatonic reason in Islamic theology, they completely parted ways with it. What rewards can the Abrahamic worshippers of the Jewish God expect for the destruction of truth, of mystagogic initiations, for obscuring the heavens with the great Jew, the great corpse and the great fanatic? In the cult of Attis and Kibbeleh, salvation was accomplished through blood in the Taurobolium ritual, where initiates were sprinkled with bull's blood, and the shepherd god Attis became a prominent part of the cult in the later antiquity. The feast of Attis, Hilaria, fell on 25th of March, exactly when Christians, by replacing this festival, designated it for the death and ascension of their Christ. Fast were part of the cult of Kibbeleh. Proclus himself underwent a month-long fasting while venerating Magna Mater, Originally, Christians used fasting as an argument against the cult of Kibbeleh until they adopted this custom themselves. 
How did Christians themselves explain borrowing these rights? Well, the theologian that they the tried to St. Augustine claimed that pagans imitate Christians inspired by the devil, not realizing that the rituals preceded even the Jewish gnosis from which Christianity derived. Young Attis was said to be miraculously revived three days after his murder. Celebrating the cycle of life and renewal was on one of the major festivals of the Metra cult. Thus, Attis was a promise of life's rebirth, and the representation of mourning for Attis had a common tomb motif found throughout the Mediterranean ancient world. It is the figure of Attis that Christianity absorbed, portraying the Christ as the Good Shepherd. Furthermore, Kibbele herself posed a difficulty for Christian theological terminology. Kibbele was a virgin goddess and threatened the figure of the Levantine Virgin Mary, similar to Artemis or Hecate even. In the 4th century, the title of the Mother of God, Theotokos, was exclusively assigned by Christians to the Jewish mortal Mary. Kibele, as Mater Deum, was irreconcilable with this terminology. Frequent are the substitutions of names and the appropriation of replacement of symbols and theology. We could use the motive of the starry heavens, they are the same. Various cults address them differently, but when complex theological system is ruined by fanatics who mix this system with their own mire, they then substitute their own names and words, pretending they have triumphed over the mob only, it is a serious historical distortion. There is no one God, at least among humans. Within the very monotheism of Abrahamic religions, there are many versions, simulations and projections of what is their God. The problem arises when these models are imposed on more inclusive, open cults or religious phenomena. Another example might be the title Pontifex in Rome, once a priest of Jupiter or Mars. The Pope, who titles himself Pontifex, has nothing to do with theology of ancient Rome, for which the title was exclusive, contrary to Christian theology. The name was preserved, but it no longer has anything to do with the content, structure and entire ideological background and superstructure. The Metroach cult was old, venerable and deeply rooted in antiquity, while Christianity was a new creation. Kibele had her official cults in Rome, at least since the Second Punic War, because she had roots in Phrygia. She was connected with Troy, the legendary cradle of Romans, as they wished, Virgil and Aid. Her cult was both for those who needed mysticism and for maintaining a sense of being Roman. Emperor Julian's hymn to dedicated to the Mother of Gods was addressed precisely to Kibele. Salustius Philosophicus tried to incorporate the myth of Attis, illuminating the theological corpus of Neoplatonism, which was at war with Gnostics and Christianity. Major, ma mature cults often played a significant role in the reaction against the lies of Christianity, and Christians eagerly attacked traditional cults, most often by dragging the opponent onto vulgar terrain and attacking him viciously. Recent, subtle, intellectual discussions was unpalatable to Christians, knowing they would lose badly with their backward minds. The cult of Attis, however, was not viewed favorably in Rome. It was a foreign god who castrated himself, furthermore being effeminate. Despite populist efforts, an example might be the anti-Christian work of Celsus, the true logos, where he compared Christianity to the Metra cult to discredit it. Thus, against his will, he provided future Christians with arguments used in polemics against the pagan great goddess Kybele. Decadence in the popular mind came to Rome from the Orient. The Metra cult was an Oriental cult making it easy to equate all oriental cult with subversives in Rome, while simultaneously attempting to replace the values, theology, superstructure of pagan Rome by convincing the plebs and slave to the new creation of the Levant. How exactly did an import from Galilee manage to be portrayed as being in Rome's interest rather than another oriental whimsy? Perhaps through populist sentiment 
with relatively low cost of the initial religion, as well as a simple belief system that facilitated a soteriological leap without any responsibility or effort, while simultaneously absorbing and degenerating more complex beliefs which required hard work. The theological entropy of late antiquity was high, there was no need to cut its roots, only to create a crude vessel named Christianity, into which through negantropic decay by the plebs, theological crumbs of high culture were to fall. This vehicle, vessel, was exploited throughout the Middle Ages in Europe. The last Tower of Volume was recorded in 390 Anno Bastardi, and a year later, Emperor Theodosius banned paganism. Thank you.